Have a seat. Hey church, missing you guys so much. Having an amazing time over here in Belgium. Just thank you so much for sending us here and just prayers to you guys. And I want to ask that you pray for us to continue to bless us and give us a safe ride home. See you guys in a bit. Thank you, church, for sending us here in Belgium. It looks like Belgium. <laughs> Hi. Hey, Spring. Hi, church. We miss you. We're having so much fun, but we miss you guys so much. Thanks for sending us. We love you. See you soon. Uh, Mahai has been um, being able to serve God in such a beautiful place. Mahai has been singing up here um, because it sounds really, really good up here. And, and the acoustics are good. It's very fun worshiping up here with everybody. Just want you to know that the youth group that you sent us, they are just awesome. Thank you so much for sending them. What she said. <laughs> <laughs> okay. <laughs> well, welcome. We're glad that you're here today at the Springs and that we, as you can see our half our youth group is in Belgium on a mission trip and uh, doing a great job and having a wonderful time and uh, if you're visiting with us today we want to just first of all say welcome and that we're glad you're here and there are some visitor cards in the breezeway if you wouldn't mind filling one out and leaving one in the in the collection basket or if there's a feedback box back there too we we'd like to get to know you so welcome Coming up this Saturday, we have a women's event called an If Gathering that we're going to gather some women and we're going to have um, some round tables set up and, and we're going to have a video, some dynamic speakers via video. We're going to have group and table discussions, kind of like table talk. We're going to share lunch together and of course we're going to have lots of worship and prayer. But most of all, it's going to be one of those times where we just get together and encourage one another and ask God to move in us wherever we are and move in us as a group. So we ask you to please come. And um, you, can, you can come that on Saturday and register or you can go on our website and register. Um, we'd like to have a head count so we can make sure we have enough lunch for everybody. But please come. Um, also, we did Backyard Bible Camp at Cross and Crown, and this group right here was the group that led the way, and they did. We, they led the Bible story, the large group. They did all the stations, and I've got to say, it was 100, over 100 degrees, I think. My van said 102. I don't know. It was over 100 degrees, and they did not complain at all. So big hand to this bunch. <laughs> It was a job well done, for sure. Good job, you guys. Um, Brian and Holly Hickson, along with Alexis and Grace, are here this morning. Where are you, Brian and Holly? Wait, right here. There they are. They're here from uh, Kigali, Rwanda. Now, and Brian and Holly have been working with Christ Church Rwanda in Kigali and also with Kigali International um, Community School. There it is. We call it Kicks. 
And so for 10 years, they have been working and serving and loving in Kigali, Rwanda. So, and Alexis is, has graduated, and so she will start this fall at Pepperdine University. So big stuff happening in this family. But we welcome you. Give them a hug. And lastly, I wanted to say a hooray that Rachel is here. I think she's still here. Yes, she is. Alexis had, I don't think, I think most of you know Alexis had surgery on her back, and she is about three or four inches taller than she was, but um, here's Rachel Richardson, and Alexis and Samaria are here today, and I know they are loving being out, um, but we're praising God for great healing so far, and just all that's happening, but give Rachel a big hug, she is a hero. Well, in addition to the uh, praises that Kelly has uh, announced for Rachel and for the Hickson family being here, it's always a joy to be able to introduce those who want to place their formal fellowship with the Springs congregation. And so this morning, we welcome Brent and Tara Stafford. May Excellent. So glad that you're here. Brent teaches people how to play guitar and when. <laughs> Tara is a graphic designer. She also is a winner. As we all are through Jesus Christ, because this is the word of the Lord. Thank you, Brent and Tara. Thank you for the gifts that you are already using to help to build up this congregation. As you know, those who went to Belgium to work with the Brazils in Antwerp are to return this week on Wednesday. We'll be praying for safe travel. Also, about 1.30 um, this morning, uh, Nancy McCurdy was uh, taken to Oklahoma Heart Hospital. Uh, she is now in room 320, and I talked to John, and she's doing okay. Um, he said a common word which is being floated around is pacemaker. So let's pray. Lord, we're thankful for the Staffords, for their addition to this congregation. We do pray for the safe travel of those returning from Antwerp mission trip and we're thankful for the, all of the work that, that they will have done. We pray for the leading of this congregation in the search for new elders and for those whom you will call. We pray for healing for, for Nancy and the means uh, being used will bring her to your health through your grace and through your power. And we thank you in all things through Jesus. Amen. All right, as we stand and continue to worship, um, read this scripture with me. Your word is a lamp to my feet and a light to my path. I have sworn an oath and confirmed it to observe your righteous ordinances. I am severely afflicted. Give me life, O Lord, according to your word. Accept my offerings of praise, O Lord, and teach me your ordinances. I hold my life in my hand continually, but I do not forget your law. The wicked have laid a snare for me, but I do not stray from your precepts. Your decrees are my heritage forever. They are the joy of my heart. I incline my heart to perform your statutes forever to the end. Amen. Got my rock, got my rock, got my rock. 
You will stand when others fall. You are faithful through it all. God, my rock, God, my rock, God, my rock. In the blessing, in the pain. Through it all, you never fail me. You are the strength of my heart. You are the strength of my heart. I can rely on you. I can rely on you. When I've struggled to believe, you have not let go of me. God, my rock, God, my rock, God, my rock. Carried through the darkest storms, you have held me in your arms. God, my rock, God, my rock, God, my rock, in the blessing, in the pain. Through it all, you never failed me. You are the strength of my heart. You are the strength of my heart.
Holy Spirit, we do invite your presence here. We thank you that you welcome us every day, every minute. We thank you that you welcome us to your table. We thank you that you've taken the unworthy and made us worthy through Jesus Christ. You welcome us to your table. Help us to remember, but help us to commune with you. In Jesus' name, come to the tables. Yeah. 
Father's arms are open wide. Forgiveness was bought with the precious blood of Jesus Christ. Oh, come to the altar. The Father's arms are open wide. Forgiveness was bought with the precious blood of Jesus Christ. Bear your cross as you wait for the crown Tell the world of the treasure you found Let's stand up and continue worshiping. Thy word is a lamp unto my feet and a light unto my path. Thy word is a lamp unto my feet and a light unto my path. When I feel afraid, think I lost my way, still you're there right beside me. Nothing will I fear as long as you are near. Please be near me to the end. Thy word is a lamp unto my feet and a light unto my path. Thy word is a lamp unto my feet and a light unto my path. I will not forget your love for me, and yet my heart forever is wandering. Jesus, be my guide, and hold me to your side. I will love you to the end. to my feet and the light unto my path. Thy word is a lamp unto my feet and a light unto my path. Man of sorrows, what a name
God before time. We are a vapor, you are eternal, love everlasting, reigning on high. Holy, holy Lord God Almighty, Jesus, Redeemer, mighty to save. You are the love song we'll sing forever. Bowing before you, blessing your name. Holy, holy Lord God Almighty. Springs Church. If you are tuning in on the live stream, I want to say welcome and thank you for joining us via the web. And if you're here this morning, again, thank you for being here. Uh, especially if you're a visitor, uh, we just we want to welcome you and uh, just say thank you so much for choosing to worship with us and choosing to check things out and be here. Uh, there's actually been a lot of new faces popping up lately. There's been a lot of new members, the Staffords. Um, very exciting. If you get a chance to talk with them afterwards, they are great people and are going to be a big part of this congregation. So, uh, Also, new baptisms. This is the first Sunday that Grace Watson has been here since her baptism. So let's give it up for Grace. Very exciting to see this body flourish in so many different ways. So, We are continuing our sermon series this morning, The Word of the Lord. And as we uh, have, have done in the past, we are taking from the lectionary, and this morning we'll be looking at the epistle text that's provided, and it is a rich one. So I do, I want to dive right in this morning to Romans chapter 8, 1 through 11. Um, and I want to specifically look at this passage and three different components of it. So if you're taking notes, we're going to look this morning at Romans 8, 1 through 11. And we're going to look at the law, the Messiah, and the Spirit. The law, the Messiah, and the Spirit. So as with the last couple of weeks, when I finish reading the text, I will say the word of the Lord, and you all will respond with thanks be to God. So let's go ahead and begin in Romans chapter 8, verse 1. There is therefore now no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus. For the law of the life-giving Spirit in Christ Jesus has set you free from the law of sin and death. For God achieved what the law could not do because it was weakened through the flesh. By sending his own son in the likeness of sinful flesh and concerning sin, he condemned sin in the flesh, so that the righteous requirement of the law may be fulfilled in us who do not walk according to the flesh, but according to the Spirit. For those who live according to the flesh have their outlook shaped by the things of the flesh. 
But those who live according to the Spirit have their outlook shaped by the things of the Spirit. For the outlook of the flesh is death, but the outlook of the Spirit is life and peace. Because the outlook of the flesh is hostile to God, for it does not submit to the law of God, nor is it able to do so. Those who are in the flesh cannot please God. You, however, are not in the flesh, but in the Spirit. If indeed the Spirit of God lives in you. Now if anyone does not have the Spirit of Christ, this person does not belong to him. But if Christ is in you, Your body is dead because of sin, but the Spirit is your life because of righteousness. Moreover, if the Spirit of the one who raised Jesus from the dead lives in you, the one who raised Christ from the dead will also make your mortal bodies alive through his Spirit who lives in you. The word of the Lord. Let's pray, church. God, we do give thanks to you this morning. God, I thank you for this time of worship, for the music, for the prayer, and for the proclamation of your word, for your table, and for the presence of your spirit this morning, God. We pray that you would permeate our hearts, that you would permeate the text and reveal it to us, God, that you would give me the gift of preaching, And that you would speak a word of gospel truth to us. And it's in the powerful name of Jesus that we pray. Amen. No condemnation. These first words of our text jump off the page and ring in our ears like the opening notes of a Star Wars movie. You know what I'm talking about. The theater is totally dark. The darkness of the theater, the silence, and then suddenly that huge golden logo just blasts across the screen and you hear this fanfare, this trumpeting of John Williams right into your ears. And, And that is how this text jumps off the page at me. No condemnation. And yet the curious thing is that in this lectionary series, we're not in the beginning of the Romans text. We've jumped right into the middle right into chapter 8. And Ben Ben did wonderfully kick us off in this series a couple weeks ago with Romans chapter 6. But still, we don't have the same kind of context that we had when we went through, say, Ephesians last spring, and we got to start from the first word of Paul to the very last page of the letter. And so this morning, I don't know if you're the type who likes to kind of wade in slowly to the pool, getting yourself acclimated, but we're jumping right in. We are are cannonballing right into the the deep end of the Romans pool in in chapter 8 this morning. And let me tell you, it is very deep water. Uh, This is monumental uh, theology right here. And this is, I, I don't think I'm speaking in hyperbole when I say that aside from the Gospels, probably the most, single most important Christian document in Christian history. Paul's letter to the Romans. The list of people that have been transformed by this letter whose lives have been changed is thousands of miles long and it includes such formidable church history names as St. Augustine and Martin Luther and Karl Barth, people who who reread this letter and started revolutions in the process and were also changed within. And as I alluded earlier, not only are we in this monumental book of Romans, but we are at the heart of it. We are at the very center of Paul's theology, and we are in the pinnacle of this letter in chapter 8. So I want to jump right back into verses 1 through 3, where Paul says, There is therefore now no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus. For the law of the life-giving Spirit in Christ Jesus has set you free from the law of sin and death. For God achieved what the law could not do because it was weakened through the flesh. So for a little bit of Romans context, we've been talking about the law. Paul is is talking about the law delivered to Moses by God on Mount Sinai to his people, the Israelites. And what we need to, to note in Paul's discussion of the law 
is that uh, the law is not itself the problem for God's people. You know, there's kind of this, I sense this sort of undercurrent in Christianity sometimes where we think that, well, Jesus actually kind of saved us from Judaism. Well, first of all, Jesus was a Jew. So that's, that's not exactly the case, though, but I feel like we kind of think that, you know, we can kind of just saw off those first 39 books in our Bibles and get rid of them, and, and that's kind of gone and done with. But, but that's not what Paul is saying here this morning. Paul's not saying that the law itself is the problem. In fact, the law is not villain, but victim. So, like us, weakened by the flesh... The law is not the villain, it has become the victim, as we are. So who is the villain? The villain is sin, with a capital S. Sin and death, we might even say. And so the problem is that that the law has been weakened by the flesh, and even though it was intended to bring life, the law has now begun to bring death, because sin is law-defeating. So great is the power of sin, so weak is the flesh that even though the law was intended for good, intended for life, it spelled death for God's people. In fact, take a look at Romans 7, 9 through 10, just before our text, Paul says, Once I was alive apart from the law, but when the commandment came, sin sprang to life and I died. I found that the very commandment that was intended to bring life actually brought death. If you've ever been working in a group project at work or at school, uh, you might know uh, somebody who's been in your group, God bless them, who had fantastic ideas, who, who had ideas to contribute, but had no way to actually help you implement them. You know, this person who, you know, they can see all the holes in in your ideas and they have these great ideas that they're bringing to the table, but they can't see their way to get you from A to B to actually contribute to the effort in a concrete, tangible way. That's kind of the law in Romans 7 and 8. It has great intentions, no execution, no power to actually, you know, surmount the opposition to it because Sin is law-defeating. But Paul's got good news for us. Paul has gospel for us in chapter 8. Take a look again at verses 3 and 4. For what the law was powerless to do, because it was weakened by the flesh, God did by sending his own Son in the likeness of sinful flesh to be a sin offering. And so he condemned sin in the flesh in order that the righteous requirement of the law might be fully met in us who do not live according to the flesh, but according to the Spirit. So as we dive a little bit deeper into this pool, I want to look at Paul's use of the word flesh. Because I think sometimes when we hear this this contrast between flesh and spirit, we have a tendency to think that Paul is rejecting the physical order. Uh, that he's rejecting the physical in favor of the non-physical. But that's, that's not what's going on here. Paul has different language for physical or non-physical. And, and furthermore, Paul was a Jew. So Paul had, had a, a good, positive view of the created order. Remember, God created the world and he called it very good. Instead, what Paul is referring to with this word flesh is, is the people or things who share the corruptibility, the mortality, and the rebellion of the world. So flesh is a negative term typically for Paul, but it's, it's not a rejection of the physical created order. It's a rejection of its wrong use, its corruption and defacing and decay. So flesh refers to that rebellion in the world. In the words of Marilyn Robinson, there is never just one transgression. There is a wound in the flesh of human life that scars when it heals and often enough seems never to heal at all. That's the flesh. But what does Paul say? Paul says that God has sent his own son in the likeness of sinful flesh to be a sin offering. 
And so he condemned sin in the flesh. Verse 4, in order that the righteous requirement of the law might be fully met in us, who do not live according to the flesh, but according to the Spirit. Paul says, hey, the law couldn't cut it. And guess what? You couldn't cut it either. Weakened by the flesh as it was, the law and you could not meet God's requirements. So God put on that corruptible flesh. God sent his own son in the likeness of sinful flesh. Jesus, who didn't abolish the law, but fulfilled it. Who on the cross spoke a triumphant no to sin and a resounding yes to humanity. So guess what? Paul says we're no longer under the law of sin and death because the life-giving spirit has set us free. And it, it makes me think of the times that I have visited my high school after graduation. Have you ever done that? You know, walking around the, these halls that you've spent countless, countless hours, you know, you're getting in line and, and you're going to class and you're talking too much in class. Maybe that was just me. But, but you spent all this time and when you go back as a graduate, as an alumnus, it's totally different. You're kind of walking around in, in this different light to this different time. You're not walking to the rhythms of the bells. You're not walking to the rhythms of the classes. You're, you're totally in this different space. And you find even that when you talk with your teachers, you're on different terms with them. They're invariably a little less guarded, a little kinder, it seems, a little less demanding. You know, and, and you find that you're not under the thumb of the administration anymore. They can't write you up for tardies or send you to detention. And if you stay long enough on your visit, you might even find that the lunch ladies and the lunch gentlemen are totally different. You know, there are less restrictions on the food that you can eat. There, there are more generous portions. It's different. And that's what I find it is with the law here. That, that's almost the sense I get from Paul. That there's, there's no longer any condemnation. That, that Paul is saying that you know, those bells, you don't walk to them anymore. You've been set free. That, that you're, you're all alumni regarding the law. That, that now you walk in different ways and talk in different ways and you, you even eat in different ways. And in fact, in the, the King James translation of Galatians 3... Paul says this, Wherefore the law was our schoolmaster to bring us unto Christ, that we might be justified by faith. But after that faith has come, we are no longer under a schoolmaster. For you are all the children of God by faith in Christ Jesus. For as many of you as have been baptized into Christ have put on Christ. And that's just the thing. We're not the ones who did it. We didn't even graduate. It was Jesus who graduated. Jesus went to all of our classes. Jesus is the one who aced the test, who, who graduated with honors and freed us from this law of sin and death. Jesus' is faithfulness. But not only did Jesus free us again from the law of sin, he also freed us from the law of death because the Messiah is death-defying. The powers of sin and death were law-defeating, but Jesus Christ, in Him, God dealt with the powers of sin and death because the Messiah is death-defying. As Paul says in Romans 6, We were therefore buried with Him through baptism into death, in order that just as Christ was raised from the dead through the glory of the Father, we too may live a new life. For if we have been united with Him in a death like His, we will certainly also be united with Him in a resurrection like His. And indeed, in verses 10 and 11 of our text this morning, listen as he says, But if Christ is in you, your body is dead because of sin, but the Spirit is your life because of righteousness. 
Moreover, if the spirit of the one who raised Jesus from the dead lives in you, the one who raised Christ from the dead will also make your mortal bodies alive through his spirit who lives in you. And so these words tell us more. They tell us more than just that the Messiah is death-defying. They also tell us that the Spirit is life-defining. It's, it's worth noting here that in the first seven chapters of Romans, Paul uses the word Spirit three times. In chapter 8 alone, Paul uses the word Spirit 19 times. It is the beating pulse of this marvelous chapter. Listen again in verses 5 and 6. For those who live according to the flesh have their outlook shaped by the things of the flesh. But those who live according to the Spirit have their outlook shaped by the things of the Spirit. For the outlook of the flesh is death. But the outlook of the Spirit, say it with me church, is life and peace. Not only does the Spirit of Jesus Christ defy death, the Spirit of Jesus Christ defines life and right now. This future hope that we have has a dramatic impact on how we see things in the present. I love how the New English translation that we just read says it that if you're living according to the Spirit, you have your outlook shaped by the things of the Spirit. The Spirit gives us vision. Vision to see God's good future and vision to see to live into that future in the present. You know, these words that Paul wrote literal millennia ago have the same power today for us. There is therefore no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus. Because the Messiah is death-defying and the Spirit is life-defining. In a list of the most important theologians of the 20th century, Karl Barth and Reinhold Niebuhr would pretty easily be very well near the top. And unsurprisingly, these two men approached theology in very different ways, um, ways that I think can be contrasted in the answer to, to a simple question, and that is, what is real? Now, I know this sounds like the inane, silly question of some bored philosopher, but but stick with me, because the way that Niebuhr did theology was very much centered in humans. Theology for Niebuhr started in humanity, so the answer to the question, what is real, would have to start there. It would have to start with what is most evident about us and our nature and our condition. So the answer to what is real would be sin. Sin is the most evident thing about us, and so when your theology begins in man, that's inevitably the answer. For Niebuhr, love is, is less real, and it's more of this kind of unattainable ideal. You know, love is an ideal, sin is real. But contrastingly, the way that Karl Barth did theology began in God. It began not in human beings, but it was centered around God. And so the greatest thing, the clearest thing that we know about God and who He is and what He does is His love for us revealed in Jesus Christ. So for Bart, the answer to the question of what is real is the love of God. The love of God is the most real, the most defining thing about us. Sin is this kind of this impossible possibility. Sin is this shadow side of love. Its existence is conflicted and its destiny is to vanish when God makes all things right. So what is most real for Karl Barth when we ask the question centered in God, is God's love in Jesus Christ? Now you might say though, you might say, Brett, I mean the data of my life says differently. The data of my life says sin is very real for me. It absolutely is that, that this is a part of who I am, of my fabric. And this is, this is who I am. This is what's real. But that line of thinking 
ignores the fact that not all data is created equal. And when we ask the question from God, what is real about us? The data point, the only data point that matters is the cross and the resurrection of Jesus Christ. If you are in Christ, that is what is most real about you. What is most real about you is, is not your sin, is not the struggles and the wrestling, is not the voices in your head. What is most real about you is what God says about you. And God says, I love you in Jesus Christ. And God says, I condemn sin in the flesh and I've freed you from that law of sin and death. You're not defined by the flesh, you're defined by the Spirit. The Spirit of the crucified risen Messiah Jesus so church are you in Christ have you passed through those waters of death into the freedom on the other side salvation in Christ alone that's where we need to be that's where we need to be church because in Christ there is therefore now no condemnation let's stand and praise him together this morning final words in Romans chapter 8 where he says in all these things we are more than conquerors through him who loved us for I'm convinced that neither death nor life nor angels nor rulers nor things present nor things to come nor powers nor height nor depth nor anything else in all creation will be able to separate us from the love of God in Christ Jesus our Lord. Go in peace, church. Of angels, we can move.